Well, hey there, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in to our virtual worship service here at Heritage Church in Fort Worth. You know, the days of my preaching to a camera in an otherwise empty room seem to be drawing to a close because we're resuming in-person services here on March 28th. But today, I'm coming to all of you digitally, and we're wrapping up a series of messages we've been walking through together called The Me God Can See. Now, this series has given us the chance to explore some stories about characters from the Old Testament portion of the Bible, which is the part of the Bible that deals with the time before Jesus walked the earth as a human. And in each of the stories we've looked at so far, we've encountered people that God wanted to utilize for something world-changing. But the people themselves weren't so sure. We looked at the story of Abraham and Sarah, a married couple that God used to begin a family tree that would bless the whole world. But Abraham and Sarah were over 90 years old before they had their first child together, and they couldn't imagine what God was up to. We looked together at the story of Gideon, who God chose to be a leader, even though Gideon never pictured himself that way. And then the next week, we studied the story of Jonah, a man that God appointed to be a missionary, even though that's actually the last thing that Jonah wanted to do at that stage in his life. And then last week, we considered Esther, who was afraid and unsure, but ended up being a part of God's big salvation plan. And I tell you what, despite their circumstances, all of the people that we've studied so far, they were pretty ordinary people for their time. They had extraordinary things that happened to them but they weren't people who were out looking for adventure. These weren't people who were heroes with superhuman talents or any kind of special training. In fact, these were all people who felt confused and underqualified and doubtful. But all four of the stories we covered earlier in this series had one other thing in common, and that is that Once those characters decided to trust God or obey God's instructions, it resulted in a big, powerful ending to the story. Abraham and Sarah became first-time parents when all their peers were becoming great-great-grandparents. Gideon led an army that was outnumbered a hundredfold and liberated his people without ever using a weapon. Jonah preached for one day and convinced an entire pagan city to repent and ask God for forgiveness. And Esther bravely confronted and persuaded the king of Persia to save her people from genocide. Each time, in each of these stories, God took those characters and their little bit of faith and did something really big with it. But today, as we wrap up this series, I want us to look at a character who had a who had a completely different experience. A character who was given an assignment from God, and though he was scared, he rose to the challenge. He showed up and served faithfully, and he did what he was asked to do, and the only problem was that all of his service to God made no discernible difference at all. Now, all of us know how discouraging it is to find out that the time or energy or resources that we have invested into a project aren't paying off, right? I mean, nobody likes to waste their time, and nobody wants to discover that their effort isn't making a difference. You can find a lot of social science research about the average human's greatest fears, and Studies show that if you were to survey a cross-section of people and ask them about their greatest fear in life, you'd get some common answers like fear of heights or fear of snakes or fear of running out of money. But one of the most common answers is that people are afraid their life won't make a difference. And here's what I know about you because I know this is true of all of us. If you're assigned to a job and it feels like you're not making any progress, that'll be frustrating to you. But if you choose to devote yourself to a mission, something that's important to you, and you give it everything you've got, and you invest time and effort, and you pray about it, and you still can't tell any difference, well, that'll make you question everything. 
And some of you I know are feeling that way right now because of the circumstances in your life. I know some of your personal stories, and I know that right now you're praying diligently for the faith of a loved one in your life. Maybe it's your teenager or your adult child, and you're trying to be patient, and you're praying, and you're just trying to talk to them about faith, and it seems like all the while they're moving further and further away. And it keeps you awake at night wondering, what could I possibly do? What could I have done differently to help them believe? I know there are some of you who are trying everything you've got to hold a marriage together. And you've done everything you know to do. And you've prayed about this like you've never prayed about anything else before. And it's hard to tell if things are getting even a little bit better. And you're getting that feeling that maybe it's not going to get any better. Your situation may not match those examples, but chances are someone listening to this message has something they've been waiting and and expecting to happen for a long time, some breakthrough, some improvement, some, some shift that would make life seem so much better. And maybe, that, maybe you've been waiting on God to do the part that only God can do, but it seems like you've been waiting forever. And if you can relate to that feeling, then I want you to know you've got a lot in common with the character that we're studying today, a man named Jeremiah. You see, Jeremiah was one of the many prophets or messengers that God deployed to preach to the Jewish people in the Old Testament portion of our Bible. We have books about lots of these prophets in our Bible, people like Samuel and Isaiah and Amos and Malachi. But Jeremiah had the distinction of being essentially the last in the long timeline of the Old Testament prophets before Judah, his kingdom, his nation, was completely overrun and conquered by the Babylonians. And the Babylonian invasion was not a surprise to Jeremiah. In fact, predicting the Babylonian invasion was the major theme of most of Jeremiah's preaching. When God commissioned Jeremiah as a prophet, God told him this. He said, listen, I am calling the armies of the kingdoms of the north to come to Jerusalem, to your capital city. I, the Lord, have spoken. They will set their thrones at the gates of the city. They will attack its walls and all the other towns of Judah. You see, God was telling Jeremiah about 40 years in advance, that God was raising up foreign armies that would eventually occupy Judah. And when you become familiar with the Old Testament narrative, you know that the people of Judah, the Jews, were God's covenant people. But God saw that the people of Judah had chosen a course that was opposite of their calling. And so God said in the next verse to Jeremiah, I will pronounce judgment on my people for all their evil, for deserting me and burning incense to other gods. Yes, they worship idols made with their own hands. But after leveling these charges against the Jews, God addresses Jeremiah directly. And I want you to hear what he says. God says, Jeremiah, get up and prepare for action. Go out and tell them everything I tell you to say. Don't be afraid of them, or I will make you look foolish in front of them. For see, today I have made you strong, like a fortified city that cannot be captured. Like an iron pillar or a bronze wall, you will stand against the whole land, the kings, the officials, the priests, and the people of Judah. He was telling Jeremiah, you're going to stand against all of your own countrymen. And then God said, they, they will fight you, but they will fail. For I am with you, and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. This was Jeremiah's call to ministry. This was his commission. He was appointed to be a prophet, someone who spoke God's word to God's people on God's behalf. 
But he was told from the get-go that his message would meet significant resistance. And that's exactly what happened. And it wasn't just a matter of Jeremiah being unsure about how his message was being received. No, Jeremiah's prophesying, prophesying was met with active and increasingly hostile resistance. Following God's call, Jeremiah spent four decades warning the people of Judah that they were going to be destroyed because they had abandoned their covenant, but the people of Judah never wanted to hear that. They didn't believe him. And so at first they ignored Jeremiah. They ignored his doom and gloom message. They called him a traitor and they told him he didn't know what he was talking about. And in the meantime, other false prophets rose up and tried to drown out Jeremiah's warnings with more optimistic messages of their own. But when it was clear that Jeremiah wasn't backing down, he started to receive death threats and more than once the people nearly made good on those threats. Jeremiah's life's work faced constant opposition and he never witnessed any signs of progress in his ministry. There was no time in his ministry when he could say to himself, you know, I think it's working. In fact, the longer Jeremiah served, the more Judah deteriorated. It was like Jeremiah was spinning his wheels. It reminds me of a day when I was in college living out in West Texas and we were going through a severe drought and a friend of mine called me one day and wondered if I could come out to the lake to give him some help. You see, he had tried to drive his truck across this drought-stricken dry lake bed, but as he got further and further out, he discovered that that dry, crusty layer of dirt on the top was hiding a deep layer of mud underneath. And he kept his truck's momentum going for a long time, but as the mud got deeper and deeper, the truck got slower and slower until finally it came to a stop. And at that point, the only thing left to do was to stop spinning your wheels because things were only getting worse. In fact, my friend wished that he had quit a lot earlier. And I think if you and I had been in Jeremiah's shoes, we probably would have felt similar like we weren't making any progress and we probably at some point would have thought the best thing to do here is to give up because if you're anything like me you watch and you look around in your life for signs to confirm that you're not wasting your time and spinning your wheels and if you're a Christian you might even interpret progress as a sign that you are following God's will for your life and on the other hand, you might interpret failure or setbacks as a sign that maybe God wants you to be doing something else. And if Jeremiah had looked at his life that way, if Jeremiah had been the type of person to look for signs to confirm that he was doing God's will, he might have been perpetually confused and disappointed. In fact, he might have given up on what he was called to do. Because his ministry didn't seem to make any progress at all. It seemed all the time like he was just spinning his wheels and the people weren't paying attention. In fact, Jeremiah even spoke to God about this. Jeremiah wasn't shy about bringing this up with God. And there's a portion in Jeremiah chapter 20 that I want to make sure you get to see today. Because when Jeremiah spoke to God directly about his circumstances, he said, Oh Lord, you misled me, and I allowed myself to be misled. You're stronger than I am, and you overpowered me. And now I'm mocked every day. Everyone laughs at me. When I speak, the words just burst out. Violence and destruction, I shout. And so these messages from the Lord have made me a household joke. As you listen to Jeremiah's heart there, you can tell that he's distraught and frustrated that things weren't working out any better. He felt isolated and foolish because nobody, nobody was being convinced by his preaching. And none of the prophecies that he had delivered had yet come to pass either. And so he felt, he felt stuck. And he didn't feel like he could quit. He says this in verse 9. 
If I say, I'll never mention the Lord or speak in his name. His word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. And I'm worn out just trying to hold it in. I can't do it. Jeremiah knew he had to keep preaching. But it wasn't getting it getting any easier. And so he says in verse 10, I hear or I've heard the many rumors going around about me. They call me the man who lives in terror. They threaten me and say, if you say anything, we'll report it. Even my old friends are watching me, waiting for a fatal slip. He will trap himself, they say, and then we will get our revenge on him. You can tell. Jeremiah is in this messy middle, waiting to be vindicated for everything he'd said or to be released from his assignment or something. But in the midst of all of this, there was one thing that kept Jeremiah going. One promise from God that he never forgot. He remembered when he was called to be a prophet and God said, I am with you and I will take care of you. And so even on his darkest days, in the depths of his sadness, Jeremiah said, but the Lord stands beside me like a great warrior. Before him, my persecutors will stumble. They cannot defeat me. They will fail and be thoroughly humiliated. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Since Jeremiah had experienced God's salvation, he was convinced. Deep down, he was convinced that God was always with him, even if the mission didn't seem to be a success. And this is what I want you to see today in the life of Jeremiah. I want to help you understand that faithfulness doesn't always result in fruitfulness. You can be doing exactly what you're meant to be doing, exactly what God would have you do, exactly what you're called to do, and still feel like you're spinning your wheels sometimes. But I want you to hear this message from Jeremiah that says, when you aren't sure if your effort is making any difference, God sees you. God sees your trying. God sees your obedience. When you're trying your best to hold your family together, God sees you. When you're going through trials and it seems like nothing is easy for you, God sees you. When you find yourself sad or discouraged, when you're grieving or disappointed, when you want to ask God, how much longer is this going to go on? God sees you. And God sees your persistence and your perseverance. God sees your self-control and your constancy. God sees your long-suffering. God knows your struggle. And God honors your righteousness. If you were to look in the New Testament portion of the Bible, you would find a letter that we call Galatians. And in that letter, one of Jesus' earliest missionaries, a guy named Paul, encouraged his readers and said, let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And every time Paul spoke to Christians, Christians living in the Roman Empire where they were a suspect religious group out on the fringe and they often faced persecution, every time, Paul reminded them of the value of continuing to live out their calling, even if things were getting harder rather than getting easier. And that brings us to you. Because the fact is that wherever you are in your journey of faith, whether you're trying to find your way, trying to resist temptation, trying to serve, trying to share your faith, wherever you are in your faith journey, the life of faith can be lonely. But Jeremiah's experience of loneliness on his journey 
actually drew him closer to God. And it was because he knew, he was convinced that God saw him, that God was with him, that God cared for him, and that God would never leave him. And so my prayer for you this morning, my great hope for you, is that in your spiritual journey, when you experience trial, when you experience loneliness, when you find yourself sitting in pain, that you would be able to believe in that moment that God is closer than ever before. The Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted. The Lord sees you, sees your struggle, sees what you're going through, and the Lord doesn't forget you, just like he never forgot Jeremiah. And I know, I know that when you have the confidence that God is close, that God is near, that God cares, that God loves you, and that God won't leave you, you can walk through dark, dark times and still have faith that carries you through. And so that's going to be my prayer for you this morning. As we wrap up this message and as we wrap up this series, my prayer for you is that you'll always know that God sees you and he's not going anywhere. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for these stories of faith, sometimes faith that was in its infancy, sometimes faith that was being challenged, sometimes faith that was on the verge of collapse. But Father, in each of the stories we've looked at, we've been able to watch as you cared and you were present and you delivered and you participated in the story of humanity. You engaged with us. Father, there are moments in this life because of our limited perspective, because of our feeble ability and our weak faith, there are moments in this life, Father, when it's hard for us to tell that you're so close. But Father, may these stories, may these narratives that we've explored together, may they remind us that you always see us. And that we, when we respond in faith, even just the tiniest, smallest little bit of faith, you can do big things with it. May that be the story that you tell in our lives, we pray through Jesus' name. And amen. I'm thrilled that you tuned in today, and I'm so, so grateful that I got to spend this time with you. I hope you have a fantastic week. I hope that if you're local here in Fort Worth, we'll see you tonight from 4 to 6 for our church-wide picnic here on our campus. And I hope I'm going to see you in person on March 28th here in Fort Worth. Until then, we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us. Have a fantastic week, and may God bless you.